guys. Welcome to our Read It Again online author series. Today, I'd like to welcome my friend and fellow Agnes Scott alum, Dr. Carolyn Curry. Hey, Carolyn. Hello, hello. Glad to be here. So, um, Carolyn, um, uh, she wrote a book called Suffering Goes Wrong, which is the life of Ella can you, Gertrude Clayton Thomas. Ella Gertrude Clanton Thomas. Clinton. Yes. <laughs> well, it's not a name you've heard a lot. That's okay. No, That's why I wrote the book. Woman. <laughs> and uh, she was uh, like the premier. She was the most important Georgia suffragette like ever. And Carolyn has some really interesting information about her. And and guys, this is really important because right now this is the 100th anniversary of the right for vote for women, which is why I'm wearing white today. And this is just really important for us to hear and to learn. And um, our bookstore is in Georgia. So this is a part of our history. Um, and Carolyn, let's see, I'll go. I'll do Carolyn's bio real quick. Uh, Dr. Carolyn Newton Curry holds a BA in English from Agnes Scott. So I got my ring on. And a master's and a PhD um, in history from Georgia State University. She has taught at Westminster Schools in Atlanta and the University of Kentucky. Curry is the founder and chair of Women Alone Together, a nonprofit uh, foundation created to meet the needs of women who are alone in our culture. The well being of women, past and present, is her lifelong passion. So she's also married to a famous ex football player. But, you know, it wasn't in the book. <laughs> Um, Carolyn, do, do you mind telling us a, a quick um, rundown um, before we get into the slideshow so we can get people interested in it? Um, can you tell us a little bit just about your book? Just a, a quick summary. Yes. Okay. Well, I'm just going to say that well, nobody's heard of this woman in Georgia, probably, uh, unless they're from Augusta, Georgia, where she was born. But when I was in graduate school, it was back in the 70s. I mean, I'm a lot older than a lot of you are. But this was when we were first talking about the women's rights movement. And I wanted to know about women and I wanted to know about women in Georgia. So when I had to write my dissertation, I said, I want to find a woman in Georgia that's interesting that I can write a biography of. And I was lucky enough to have an advisor who recommended that I go to Duke and uh, look at the diary of Ella Gertrude Clanton Thomas. This woman from Georgia that kept a diary for 41 years before, during, and after the Civil War. And it's a real historical treasure. And historians knew about the diary as a Civil War treasure, but no one had ever written a biography of the woman. And this is the first biography of this woman. And there's so much that happens after she quits keeping the diary. Um, when her family went bankrupt after the war and they were truly, they had suffered so much, which I'll touch on some more later. But she came to Atlanta and she was able to throw herself into the movement for women that was just beginning in Georgia at that time. And we were late starting, but she ended up being president of the Georgia Women's Suffrage Association and people didn't know about her. So I've spent the last few years telling people. and. Um, I enjoy telling more of it today. Yeah, and this book won the, was it the uh, George Simon book, a book all Georgians should read. So we have copies here in the store and I'm sure I can figure out a way to get them autographed because Carolyn does live in Atlanta, um, but we can figure it out. So if anybody's interested in an autographed copy, we can make it work. So definitely support your independent bookstore, especially if your independent bookstore is Read It Again Books in Swanee, Georgia. Okay, so we're gonna start our slideshow. Let me get this going. And let's switch to this. Oh, I'm just we're this we're high technology today, folks. I know. Oh my goodness. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna go away and I'm gonna let Carolyn have the floor and she can talk all about it. Okay. Okay. Have fun. Uh, oh, and if guys, if you have any questions, Feel free to put them in the comments. Um, I will answer them at the end, and um, I can post them directly to the video for everyone to see it. This is really interesting, so people pay attention. <laughs> I, can't, I can't say that enough. I just find this uh, absolutely fascinating. Okay, um, I'll be back. Great. Okay, this is, uh, oops, there you are. There you go. Uh, this is the cover of my book, uh, Suffer and Grow Strong. My publisher said to me at some point when I was writing this woman's story, find a catchy thing that she said. Well, I said she didn't say catchy things, but she said over and over when life got very, very difficult, 
that she wished she could meet some women, some strong, intelligent women that had suffered and grown strong. And I say in the book that she became that woman herself and she met the strongest women of her period in history in the 19th century and that we should remember her name and we should remember the other women of the period. And the way this enhanced version came out this February was my publisher asked me to write about what happened after she died and what happened between the time she died in 1907 up to the passage of the amendment in 1920. And we added that chapter. And what when I was traveling around the country, the Southeast in particular, talking about this woman's life, I realized that people did not know not only the history in Georgia, but they did not know generally women's history of the suffrage movement. So that's what this new edition is about. Briefly, Ella Gertrude Clanton was born in 1834 in Augusta, Georgia, to one of the wealthiest families in the state. Her father owned 10, uh, 12,000 acres of land, six plantations. He had almost 400 slaves and he had made his fortune on the cotton trade. But as happened to everyone in the South after the Civil War, they lost all of that. And the people had to find a way to reinvent themselves. And this is what attracted me to this woman's story. She was able to throw herself into the reinvention of who she was and what she could do to help her family. But uh, one way, she was very intelligent. She had a passion for reading, as I'm sure all of you do. And her father recognized that great love of reading, and he sent her to Wesleyan in Macon, which was the first college for women in America. And she prospered there, graduated in 1851. And then she said in her diary that that is when her troubles began. She got married and she married a man named uh, J. Jefferson Thomas. And uh, we may have a slide of him. Um, let's go. And uh, well, that I think comes later. But my theme of the book was, I said, telling you about this woman and the suffrage movement. But the spark for the new enhanced version came when I saw all the women in our Congress wearing white for the State of the Union message in 2019. And I wondered, do Americans know why the women were wearing white, who the women of the suffrage movement were, and how, when did it start? And how hard was it? These are just simple questions, but I find so many people don't know. So this is one of the earliest pictures where the women got dressed up in their finest. They had these beautiful white dresses and they would travel all over the country uh, promoting the suffrage issue. And if you'll go to the next slide, you will see women in our uh, Congress last year, all dressed in white in memory of these women. And they were celebrating them and they were in the next slide, I think they're high-fiving and all of that. Um, and this was, uh, I, I was delighted to see this because it, people started talking about the suffrage women and who were they, when did it start? And that's a lot of what my book is about. And if you want to look, there have always been strong, intelligent women in our history. And if you really want to go back to the beginning, it started with Abigail Adams. I believe she's in the next slide. Um, I love Abigail Adams. And I had I made a speech one time saying that Abigail Adams might have been a better president than John <laughs> because she was so intelligent. And when you read her letters, you can see that. But she wrote a very famous letter to John saying when he went off in 1776, in the new code of laws, which I assume it will be necessary for you to write, I desire that you remember the ladies and be more favorable and generous to them than your ancestors. Do not put such unlimited power in the hands of the husbands because all husbands will be tyrants if they can. If particular care and attention are not shown to the ladies, we will foment a rebellion. So. There she was. She was really speaking up. She had found her voice. But what happened? They didn't take her seriously. And what I have said, there have always been women in history trying to speak up, but it wasn't taken seriously because everybody said women don't need any rights. They're represented by their husbands. Their husbands will speak for them. That's what English common law said. And that's what our legal system was built on. So Abigail did 
spoke up, but they were not, there's no mention of women in the Constitution of the United States. So when did the Women's Rights Convention, uh, when did those meetings begin? In the North, we always look to 1848 to Seneca Falls. I think we've got a slide of Seneca Falls coming up. That's where Elizabeth Cady Stanton lived. And she lived um, in the city of Seneca Falls. She's the woman on the right there. She's the philosopher of the women's movement in the North. Um, and then the woman on the left, that's uh, Susan B. Anthony. They were the great duo, the great pair that worked so hard in the North. And um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton was really the author with some of her friends of the uh, Declaration of Sentiments. And they debated those dec that declaration for two days in Seneca Falls in 1848, July, and then voted on them. And the last thing they voted on, they were saying women should be equal to men. They took the Declaration of Independence and put the women in, said men and women should be equal. But the last thing they de debated was should they put the vote in? And it was controversial. And some of the women said, oh, no, that's pushing it too far. We can't go that far. And Frederick Douglass was at that meeting and he was a former slave and a journalist and a friend of Susan B. Anthony, and he, he pushed it. He said, yes, you should ask for the vote. So that's when we say that women first started asking for the vote, and they found their voice at Seneca Falls. So what happens in the North, if you go to the next slide, uh, there were meetings all over the North in 1851. There was a very famous meeting I, where Sojourner Truth, a former slave, made her famous speech, Ain't I a Woman?, I used, sometimes I'll do segments of her speech because it was so colorful and she was a great speaker. Uh, but she made a great statement about women, all women, black and white, should have equal rights with men. And if you'll go to the next slide, um, you will see um, that uh, even though they were talking like that in the North, nobody's saying that in the South. Why? Because in the South, there was no abolitionist movement before the Civil War and early after the Civil War. The South is still resisting. So this, how is the movement for the vote going to get started in the South? It's going to be women like Ella Gertrude Clanton Thomas. And they start meeting in the churches. They start talking. See, Gertrude knows that women, she's beginning to question. She asks a lot of questions. Well, women uh, can't get jobs. And here after the Civil War, they desperately needed jobs. And um, she advocated for education. And she is going to be instrumental in her life to getting that movement started. But she suffered the way all women in the South suffered at that time, really women all over the country. And if you'll go to the next slide, uh, we're communicating, I'm communicating with Kim to be my slide person. <laughs> um, she married this man, J. Jefferson Thomas, the first year she got out of Wesleyan. And she said that is when her troubles began. <laughs> um, she started having babies. And I say that she probably left the best record of what women went through in childbirth in the 19th century. She gave birth to 10 children and saw four of them die. Her mother had 11 children. She had saw four of them die. So this was one of the ways that she suffered so profoundly. But not only did she suffer through childbirth the way all women did, the war came. And um, they, they did not expect it. And sometimes I equate um, the, the women were suffering from childbirth and can you believe uh, this is a drawing of a typical childbirth in the 19th century? Most of the births were in the home. They might not have had a doctor there. They were lucky if they had a midwife. Um, so many babies died. So many of the women died. It was, it was very difficult. But um, if you survived, you were fortunate. But it was uh, this ongoing struggle that continued into the Civil War. And um, there was devastation in the South, um, especially here in Atlanta, especially in Georgia. And in Gertrude's diary, she talks about fearing the Northern troops coming to her home, fearing what was going to happen. And this is Atlanta uh, when it was devastated after the Civil War. 
And it was these women who started looking around saying, what can we do? How can we help? Uh, how can we help all the widows that have been left by the war? Uh, so many of the men didn't come home. And if they did, they were suffering from post-traumatic stress. And so they tentatively started meeting in the churches, but they're going to have to take a different route from the North because they're not having those uh, meetings like they were having in Seneca Falls. So if you'll go to the next slide, you will see a woman um, that was very influential in the South. This woman is named Frances Willard. She had started the Women's Christian Temperance Union in Illinois but she traveled all over the United States and she came South and Gertrude went to South Carolina and heard her speak. And it was like a religious conversion for her. She found um, a new cause. She had to fight for women to help women who were being abused by drunken men who were not bringing their paychecks home. And she started writing articles for the newspaper and all of that. Now, why was this acceptable in the South? Look, it had Christian in the name and the women got it dressed up in their hats and gloves and it was proper. They met in the churches and the ministers would advertise to these women, uh, come to the Women's Christian Temperance Meeting at the Methodist Church and that was okay. It was appropriate. But once they started talking about getting the vote, these women realized, well, the legislators are not listening to me. We've got to get the vote. We've got to have more power. And when they start doing that, the ministers will not allow them to meet in the churches. That is not appropriate. Um, I love the statement of Warren Candler that I, and I put it in the book. I'm a Methodist, but Warren Candler uh, was just horrified. And he said, not only is suffrage not scriptural, it is sinful. So uh, the man at the Baptist church said that anybody that lets their wife, any man that lets his wife participate in the suffrage movement is simple minded. So you see how much courage it took for a woman just to speak up and say, yes, I believe women should have the vote. Um, so uh, go to the next slide and in, say in 1895, a group of very powerful women came south. That is Susan B. Anthony. And she said, and I love this quote, I hope the good men of Atlanta will understand that we women do not claim to be the better half, but we do claim to be half. <laughs> and she was not afraid to speak up. They had the national convention in Atlanta in 1895, and it was a daring move. They were coming south because they knew there were no suffrage groups organized in the states, hardly at all. And they had to get publicity in the newspaper. They wanted to get people starting to talk about it. And it was a very bold move. But this is when my subject, Ellen Gertrude Clanton Thomas, went to that convention, met Susan B. Anthony and the other women that were working in the movement. And she had enough courage. And this is what I emphasize to women all the time. You had to be so brave just to stand up and say women should have the right to vote. But Gertrude had that courage and she became, if you see the next slide, in 1899, she became president of the Georgia Women's Suffrage Association. Now, this is a portrait um, that is actually in, hangs in my, the foyer of my home. Uh, a beautiful portrait of Gertrude when she was 65 years old. She still has those beautiful brown eyes and that very strong face. But it was amazing when she was elected president, she stood up, made a speech in the House of Representatives. And this is a young woman who grew up in the conservative South that said a woman should not even stand up and make a speech of any kind. She should not even speak in church. And she spoke to hundreds of people and she stood up and said, women should be equal to men in the work of the world. She said that in a speech where she used a Christian metaphor and she said, woman was not taken from the head of man. She's not his superior. Woman was not taken from the foot of man. She's not his inferior. 
but woman was taken from the side of man and there she should stand his equal in the work of the world. But this is 21 years before we got the amendment. So that's how progressive this woman was. And it was really astounding that she had the courage to say that. And for people to, you know, for ministers and the journalists to ridicule these women, but they really were ridiculed. So it was a great act of courage on her part to be able to stand up and speak like that. But now Gertrude is going to die in 1907. Uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton dies 1902. Uh, all of these great workers of the 19th century are going to pass away. And who's going to take on the fight in the 20th century? And I'm going to show you some slides of the women who picked up the banner and took it into the 20th century. We should know their names and remember what happened. Here is a slide showing you of all those great leaders that passed away right at the turn of the century. Um, as I said, uh, Lucretia Mott was at Seneca Falls. I didn't mention her because of time, but Susan B. Anthony, she hasn't died yet. And she's actually still president of the association in 1900. And if you'll go to the next slide, in 1900, Susan B. Anthony goes to the National Convention in Washington, D.C., and of course, this is uh, her grave site in Rochester, but she's going to turn the banner over to another young woman that I'll introduce you to in a minute. But um, women were so inspired by Susan B. Anthony, who was this elderly woman in her 80s, and she's the one who carries the fight into the uh, 20th century. We all know that the the uh, amendment is going to actually have her name on it. It's called the Susan B. Anthony Amendment. And I, and I do love this picture because this was when Hillary ran. And uh, after the women voted in Rochester, New York, they all went to her grave and put little stickers on her grave. But I voted. I voted uh, because when Susan B. Anthony died, there were only four states that had given the vote to women. and. Um, she had worked so hard, but when she died, there was a she had a pin, a brooch that had four diamonds on it for the four western states, Wyoming, Idaho, Utah, and Colorado, that had given women the vote. That was such a huge thing. So um, um, she was so proud of that. But still, the women that are going to pick up the banner and take it into the uh, 20th century know they're going to have to start doing something else. So let's look at the next slide. Uh, and as I say, we need to know the names of the women who led the fight in the 20th century. This is Carrie Chapman Catt. Um, you might not know her name as well as you know Susan B. Anthony, but in 1900, when Susan B. Anthony was 80 years old, she turned over the presidency of the National Suffrage Association to this woman, who at that time was only 41. And um, she was only 41 at that time, but she will be president off and on right up until the time that the amendment is passed in 1920. And she will be the founder of the League of Women Voters. And she was a, a very strong woman who we should remember because she led the fight in the traditional way that Susan B. Anthony and Carrie, uh, uh, Susan B. Anthony and uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and those women, they were trying to get it passed state by state by state. And it was taking forever and there was so much opposition. So there's going to be a movement that takes hold that says this is we're taking too long. It's never going to work this way. We need to get a national amendment to the Constitution. So that will be the emphasis at the beginning of the 20th century. And uh, let's go to the next slide. Ah, There you go. Now, this is a woman uh, that everyone should know her name. Uh, Alice Paul, she was a young woman. She is the beneficiary of everything that Susan B. Anthony had talked about all her life. Susan B. Anthony had advocated for education for women. She was trying to get women admitted to the universities because women couldn't go to the University of Rochester. They couldn't go to the University of Georgia. They couldn't go. And she worked all of her life to get that started. And Alice Paul is the beneficiary of that. She goes to the university uh, she go, and she gets her degree. She goes to graduate school. 
She goes to England to study at the London School of Economics. She's probably one of the best educated women in America. And she devotes her life to getting the votes for women. And she's going to be influenced by the suffrage movement in England, which was more radical. See, uh, the movement in, jo- in, uh, in America, in the United States, was always get dressed up, hats and gloves, be proper, go to the legislators, try to convince them to uh, give you the vote. Well, in England, they were throwing rocks at the uh, homes of the prime minister. They were disrupting parliament and all that. And Alice Paul was in London and she saw it. But when she came back to this country, she said, no, we don't want to do it like that. We're going to be proper. We're going to be ladylike. Look at her hat, her clothes. We're going to be proper and we're not going to be violent the way they were in England. But we're going to have to change. We have to do some new things. And she for now, let's go to the next slide. Um, She is going, she had seen marches in London where the women got out in March for suffrage. And she thought, we've got to do that. Well, she had to convince Carrie Chapman Catt and the old older women in the suffrage movement that this is proper. But look at these women. They have on hats, they have on gloves, they have their nice white dresses. By this time, the women had decided they would wear white because it's the color of purity. It's also links them with their sisters in London. They decided it would photograph well. Well, look here. It certainly photographed well. And so white became the color of suffrage. Their hats are white. Many of the women in these pictures were, were, are wearing white. But when they had this great parade, Right before Woodrow Wilson was inaugurated, they also had college girls and they were marching in their cap and gowns. They had thousands of women that marched in this big parade, um, the suffrage parade in Washington, D.C. in 1913. And uh, remember, Woodrow Wilson had been elected president and Alice Paul and these young women decided we have got to get the attention of Woodrow Wilson. And Wilson has got to advocate for the vote for women. That was their strategy. And look here at Inez Mulholland. She led the parade on a white horse with her white suit. Again, the color of suffrage. And they're getting a lot of attention, but they were jeered at. And people threw things and the crowd got unruly. But they kept saying, we must be dignified. We must be dignified. And they did carry it off. And when Wilson arrived at the station, uh, coming to be inaugurated, he said, where are the people? Where are the people? And they were um, all at the parade. Now, these women, you'll see here on their banners, they used Wilson's words against him. Mr. President, you say liberty is the fundamental demand of the human spirit. And see, they are putting pressure on Woodrow Wilson himself. But we've got to remember, where was Woodrow Wilson born? Augusta, Georgia. Where did he go to law school? University of Virginia practice law in Atlanta. He is one of those Southern men who believe women could keep silent, that uh, women have certain qualities, but they do not have the qualities of men. Um, and he would say things like, I, it was appalled to hear women speak in public. And you can find a lot of the quotes of Woodrow Wilson, and you can see that he was definitely opposed to suffrage for women when he was elected. But these women make it their goal every day to protest, to march, and women surrounded the Capitol when he was inaugurated and night, the second term, they surrounded the Capitol from 10 in the morning till five in the afternoon. No matter the weather, rain, sleet, snow, these women are protesting and asking for the vote. Again, they're dressed up. They're very proper with their hats and gloves and they're dignified. But in spite of all of their dignity, And in spite of uh, how hard they work to be dignified, finally Woodrow Wilson had lost his patience and he had them arrested. And they had to go to jail for three nights or pay a $25 fine. And they were obstructing traffic is what they said. Uh, But they hadn't done anything illegal, but they were arrested because they were obstructing traffic. 
supposedly. And and then they would get out of jail, like Alice Paul would get out of jail, and she'd go right back and start protesting again. She'd get arrested again. And so finally, she was arrested so many times that she was sentenced to seven months in jail, and they sent her to a prison in Virginia. And that's when they started, uh, they started a hunger strike because the women were being so mistreated and given poor food and uh, they're not good beds and all that stuff, and they were not being treated with respect. So they went on a hunger strike, and then they started force-feeding them by forcing tubes up their noses and all that. It was just horrific. And uh, Alice, Paul, and many of these women had health issues the rest of their lives because of what they had gone through in this forced feeding. But it got a lot of bad publicity for Wilson. Word got out from these families that uh, they were uh, their, their daughters. And a lot of these women were like college women, women from middle class families um, that were willing to protest. And so they got a lot of pressure. So finally, uh, in 1917, the state of New York finally passed suffrage for women, and the pressure was growing so much by the end of World War I that Wilson is convinced that he must speak up for suffrage. So they did. They wore him down, and they pressured Wilson to go along with suffrage. So he finally goes to the House of Representatives and says they should vote for suffrage, and does. That's all they needed. That, that did it. And the House voted and immediately passed it. Well, then it took the Senate a while longer, and they finally passed it. But then what do you have to do when you finally pass an amendment? You've got to get it ratified by 36 states. And this was astounding, 36 states. And the women that were leading the fight knew that the hardest place to get the uh, ratification was going to be in the southern states, the old states of the Confederacy that didn't believe that women should speak in public, that women should be in the home. And there was also, this was the conservative South that had poll taxes and literacy tests, and they were trying to keep African-American men from voting, so they sure didn't want African-American women voting. And so there was a real resistance in the South, and all of the Southern states, except one, immediately refused to ratify. By the way, Georgia, was one of the first states that refused to ratify and did not ratify the 19th Amendment until 1970, if you can believe it. <laughs> Finally, in 1970, they ratified it. But the state of Tennessee, I love the story of the state of Tennessee. Um, they were uh, having a convention in Nashville in the summertime, and uh, they were trying to the suffrage women were there. The pro-suffrage uh, women were giving out yellow roses. That was the flower of the suffrage movement. And the anti-suffrage women were giving out red roses. And there was a young man named uh, Harry Byrne. You can see him here. You can see how young he was. And he was sporting a red rose. And he said he was against suffrage for women. And his mother sent him a telegram and she said, be a good boy and vote for suffrage. And he was a good boy. He didn't want to disappoint his mother, so he changed his vote. And Tennessee carried the amendment by one vote. And so Harry Byrne gets the credit for being the one vote that took Tennessee over and was the 36th state to ratify the amendment. So in 1920, August of 1920, it is finally ratified by enough states. And if you'll go to the next slide, uh, Alice Paul and the women were, I love this picture, they're sewing uh, stars on the suffrage flag. Each time a state ratified, they would sew a star on this uh, flag. And of course, when Tennessee uh, passed it, they that was the last star that they um, uh, sewed on. And they were so excited. They had worked. If you think about it from Abigail Adams, they had worked for 150 years or from Seneca Falls, over 70 years. And they said, we finally passed it. We want a big ceremony and we want to have a signing and we want to have a parade. We want to film it because back then, by this time, they were doing primitive videos. Well, go to the next slide. Uh, 
the Secretary of State was named Bainbridge Colby, and he got the news that Tennessee had ratified, so he signed it in his home, and it became law. <laughs> I think that's a really interesting little fact that um, the 19th Amendment was signed in the Secretary of State's home. He probably wasn't real happy about it. He doesn't look like he was happy, but we don't know. But uh, that's when the 100 years ago in August, the 19th Amendment became law. So um, what I say today, and anytime I teach a class or I speak to a group of women, I always encourage them always, always to vote because women work their entire lives to get the right of the vote for us. And it's so important. And women are still not mentioned in the Constitution of the United States. Um, if you will go to the next slide, we do have the um, Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, Alice Paul, in 1923, she'd given all of her life, she had worked for the vote, but she realized, okay, women got the vote, but they still don't get equal pay. They did not, still did not have guardianship rights of their children. They still did not have uh, education and all this. I mean, there were still so many things that women needed. So they, she started working for equal rights for women and she wanted an amendment to the constitution saying that women shall have equal rights. And if you can see on that banner, it just says equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. It's quite simple and direct, but through the years, it would come up every year in the House and the Senate, it would come up every year, and it actually passed the House and the Senate in 1972. And it, then it went through the ratification process, going through all of the states, and it was three states short. So, um, and then, um, now we've had the statute of limitations has expired, but the state of Nevada finally ratified it in 1917, I mean 2017, and then um, Illinois uh, ratified it in 2018, and then the state of Virginia ratified it um, recently in 2020. So it has the three states that it needs. And there's actually precedent for an amendment to be passed when the statute of limitations has expired, but the Congress is going to have to act on it. And I don't know, they've got so many other things on the platter right now. Uh, but we hope that finally, there will be some mention of women in the Constitution of the United States. Uh, like when Ruth Bader Ginsburg went through her Senate hearing uh, when she became a member of the Supreme Court, she said, I would like for my granddaughter to re recognize in the Constitution of the United States that she shares equal stature with men. There should be some mention in the Constitution of the United States, and there still is not. So I always say the work is unfinished, and we should keep working in the 21st century. And we do have voices. We have women speaking up in the 21st century. And I, I believe you might have a couple of, um, yes, there you go. Uh, talk about young people speaking up. Uh, Malala, you all know about um, the Pakistani young lady that was actually shot in the head by the Taliban because she wanted to go to school. And she has made a miraculous recovery. And here she is at Oxford in England, still speaking up for education for women. And then here is young Greta Thunberg that I'm sure all of you know, who speaks up so for ch climate change. So when we say that, well, it's only one person and who's gonna hear me, that's not true. We can speak up for women's rights the way Ella Gertrude Clinton Thomas did in the 19th century, the way Susan B. Anthony did and um, Alice Paul did, and these young women are speaking up now. We still have work to be done and women have wonderful voices and power. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. I put myself back into it. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I always like that. Every time I hear you speak, I get emotional. 
Oh, that's. I, I don't know if anybody else is watching and felt the same way. It's just all this is just so so important for people to know. And before the you know we all got quarantined, you were going to speak for um, a women's group for Oracle, and I was going to bring my daughter to come hear you because I think it's just so important that she hears you speak. Well, so I'm going to send her a link. That. To that. We're going to we're going to do it. When all this clears, that was for the internet celebration of the International Day of Women, which was in March in Women's History Month. And I had planned this whole slideshow for them to educate them about the history of the vote and everything. And then I couldn't give it. And I was so disappointed. And so were they. But we will reschedule that and we'll be sure that you know about it so you can come and anybody else that wants to come will be welcome. Um, Carolyn, I, I, can you talk a little bit about the organization that you um, that you have started? Yes. Women Alone. I would love to. Um, I this Women Alone Together has been going now for gosh, nineteen to approaching twenty years. But I was teaching at the University of Kentucky, and I was t- talking about the stuff I'm talking to you about. And I had older women in my course that showed up and they started auditing my class. And I I couldn't figure out what was going on. But I got to know these women and I found out at the University of Kentucky, there was a program that if you were 65 or older, you could audit classes free of charge. And these were women that were recovering from the loss of their spouse. Most of them. There was one that had gotten a divorce after a very long time, one that had never been married but they were women of a certain age who had missed out on all this women's history. Uh, They wanted to do something meaningful with their lives. They wanted to connect with other women. Um, They didn't want to spend their later years alone and isolated. They wanted to do something substantive. And so I got so interested in them and I invited them out to my home. And that was the little seed uh, that I was thinking about. And then I had, um, you've probably never heard this story, Kim. I had a dear I've heard friend, some of it. Yeah, that her, her husband was killed in a plane crash with Payne Stewart, the golfer. And I went to her home in Orlando and I saw what these women had gone through. And uh, I started sh- talking about, she was saying, we need to start something. Or where do women like me go? And I said, well, I've been thinking about starting something and I'll go. I want to do it with a college. I want to do it. I want it to be substantive. Because see, I was teaching at the University of Kentucky when this started. I said, I want to be associated with a college and what better co- place than my college, a woman's college, Agnes Scott. So I went to Mary Brown Bullock, the president of Agnes Scott. She time. was my president. OK. Mm-hmm. And Mary Brown said, oh, yes, I think that's a wonderful idea. Uh, go talk to Marilyn Hammond, who was running the Alumni Association at that point. And so we formed a partnership that's been going all these years. And we do seminars for three areas, legal, financial, health and wellness and emotional, personal growth. And we bring in expert speakers. And then every month we do a book group because the women came to me in the very beginning and they said, you know, it's sort of hard for us to go out at night by ourselves. And why don't we go to a restaurant and we love to read? Why don't we do a book group? So we started out with about five women and we would sometimes we started out actually going to each other's homes. And then they said, well, it'd be easier if we went to a restaurant. So we started going to a restaurant. And then you've been, Kim, it has grown Mm -hmm. until now on average, we'll have 35 or 40. Sometimes we might have 60 women and we go to the uh, banquet of the Colonnade restaurant, Mm -hmm. as I say, the trendy Colonnade. (laughs) And um, we just have a wonderful time. And anybody Mm -hmm. that wants to come, they're welcome. And they can go to our website, womenalonetogether.org. And they can- I'll put it in the comments. Right, right. Um, the in, in fact, I go and um, I am not quite of a certain age. No, and- you're not. You're one of the young ones. But what I want to say, Kim, is yeah. we have had some younger women come, and we love it when younger women come because I think women can learn so much no matter what their age, especially at some of these seminars. It prepares you for some of the late life issues mm-hmm. and just life issues. That women face. And Carolyn gets in, she gets in um, authors, and when she can't get an author in to speak, she often gets in local professors. Um, I was really looking forward to, you had a talk coming up with um, uh, a professor who wrote a book about Atticus Finch. Yes, he's going to come back. 
Yes, Joseph Crispino is at Emory University. He's the Jimmy Carter Professor of History at um, Emory. And by the way, he wrote the introduction to my new edition, so I'm very indebted to him. But he's a wonderful speaker and wonderful teacher. And he'll be back probably in the fall uh, to do Atticus Finch. And then Pearl McCainy, who teaches, uh, she's a dean down at Georgia State now. She's going to do Where the Crawdads Sing. Sing. And uh, that's going to be wonderful, too. And then we've got an Agnes Scott professor coming in September, um, Thompson, Peggy Thompson. And uh, I had her. We're going to do something very unusual. We're going to do excerpts from um, uh, Gulliver's Travels <laughs> because it's a political satire. We're going to have political things going on in the fall. So we'll have fun with that. Very cool. Um, if anybody has any questions. I was I was struck by when the first time I heard you speak uh, talk about how the women dressed up in their finest to come out and so that everybody could see them and during the civil rights movement African Americans here in 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 the U S did the same thing where they put on their their nicest clothes their Sunday best to go out they mm -hmm. wanted to put a really great a clean and image forward because they want to represent the best of who they are and you need to give us me mm -hmm. a woman the right to vote so here is me in my sunday best and i just i love the parallels mm -hmm. especially when you said that um because we didn't have um we, had, we were pro-slavery down here we didn't have the abolitionists so we couldn't we didn't have that that they have it in the north we were behind mm -hmm. and and I also well, love hearing your sweet Southern voice say all of this. <laughs> well, it is, it's, we were 50 years behind. And see, these women that started out in Georgia and uh, other Southern states, they had this thing, they did want to be proper. I mean, you know, they were going to be the proper Southern ladies to an extent. I mean, they were going to dress up, they were going to wear their gloves, their hats. And, and they were God fearing women. They went to the church on Sunday, you know. But if they studied, if they read, if they heard what was going on in the North and women like Ella Gertrude Clanton Thomas said, hey, we need rights. We need the vote. We need education. See, they still couldn't go to the University of Georgia. I mean, there were so many things women were being told they could not do. And, um, and these women started speaking up and they did do it in a ladylike fashion. <laughs> Even when they were being ridiculed and when they started marching, they said they were going to present their best selves. And this is another thing I want to say. Uh, Alice Paul and those women that were demonstrating at the Capitol, thousands of women that stood out in front of the Capitol in 1917 from 10 in the morning to 5 in the afternoon was the first peaceful, nonviolent protest in our country. And it was done by women. And I think it's sort of sad that when we had the civil rights movement, they modeled themselves after Gandhi because they didn't know about the suffrage women. I mean, the suffrage women had been forgotten, but we had had a nonviolent protest from women that had been successful in our country. And they were imprisoned and, you know, ridiculed and everything just like um, the civil rights workers were. So that's another thing I like to point out to people. I like, I like this image. Um, it's kind of hard to see it. But on there is a the, the, uh, the yes. voted Georgia sticker. Yes, I can see the right at the end of Anthony's name. You know, Susan B. Anthony, you see the orange peach um, from Georgia. I love that. And I don't know who was up there. Although I do, when I go to Rochester, New York, um, at the time, I spoke at the Susan B. Anthony Museum, and I stayed with an Agnes Scott graduate, Bernie Smith, who lived in Rochester. That might have been Bernie if she, well, if she would have been a Rochester citizen, she would have probably voted up there. But somebody could have been visiting Bernie, <laughs> and um, yeah, that's probably how that got up there. That was probably an Agnes Scott woman visiting in Rochester, right? <laughs> We'll say that anyway. <laughs> we'll say that. All right. Well, this was a lot of fun. I so I could listen to you speak all day, and I know you have a lot to say that you didn't even include in this talk. Um, but if anybody else is interested, 
We have copies of the book here. Carolyn, um, we can get them to her to sign them. Um, I put a link in the comments if you'd like to buy one. Um, thank you for joining us. Well, I will be happy to figure out a way to sign them. And I enjoyed this visit so much. And I'll have to come out in person later. Later. Uh, I'd love to visit your bookshop. And it sounds wonderful. And you're doing a wonderful thing with these broadcasts. Oh, thank you. Yeah, we, uh, we're open for curbside. We do local delivery and we ship. So, you know, we can ship a copy um, of Suffer and Grow Strong across the country. Anybody wants to read um, it. Please make sure you support your local bookstore, even if it's not us. Read It Again Books in Swanee, Georgia is my personal favorite, but there are lots of great bookstores out there that you should support. And thank you again, Dr. Uh, Curry, for joining us today. This is a lot of fun. Thank, thank you. you, Kim. I've loved every minute of it and hello to everybody out there and just stay strong uh suffer and grow strong during this period <laughs> okay bye-bye